The photograph reproduced on the cover of the catalogue for Gerhard Richter Panorama shows the artist standing amongst the debris of building materials on a vacant plot in an apparently abandoned city early on a sunny summer morning. The scene is downtown Halifax, Nova Scotia. But why is he holding an abstract painting in this awkward fashion, like a proud student displaying his end of year work to his teacher or parents? And what is the significance of this painting and of this moment that he should have chosen to record himself in this strange outdoor location rather than in the privacy of the studio? The answers to these questions begin to explain the dramatic shift in Richter's practice that occurred in the late 70s and which I shall hope to examine today. At the invitation of Benjamin Buchlow, Richter spent the summer of 1978 in Halifax teaching at the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. Nova Scotia, under the direction of Caspar Koenig and later Buchlow, had become a center for the discussion of conceptual practice. Amongst the visiting artists were Daniel Buren, Lawrence Wiener, Dan Graham, and Michael Asher. For Richter, at a moment of turbulence in his personal life and uncertainty in his direction as an artist, the invitation offered a welcome change from Dusseldorf, but also the challenge of putting himself in an environment that was, at best, skeptical about the practice of painting. However, Richter was used to working in such a climate. Throughout the early 70s, he had continued to show alongside European and American conceptual and minimalist artists at Conrad Fischer's gallery in Dusseldorf. His work was also included in the major exhibitions of the period, such as Documenta 5 in 1972 and Kunst bleibt Kunst in Cologne in 1974, especially as his series of grey and colour chart paintings evolved in apparent confirmation that the reductivist pass, path was the way forward for painting. In 1975, a group of six grey paintings covering the period 1970 to 74 was shown alongside work by Ryman, Charlton, Marden, Mangold, Agnes Martin, and 16 other painters in the exhibition Fundamental Painting held at the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam. In a statement for the catalogue, Richter wrote, Grey. Grey just has a clear-cut character. It does not unleash associations or emotions. Grey is neither visible nor invisible. Grey is by virtue of necessity, sorry, by virtue of its neutrality, so eminently suited to act as a mediator, to clarify, just as illusionistically as a photograph, as we've just heard. It is better than any other colour for clarifying nothingness. I am fascinated by this kind of reduced painting in general because I believe that it is trying in a very meticulous and considered way to arrive at a correct and direct manner of painting that tends towards a universal validity. The highly colored and textured abstract painting that Richter holds in a vertical orientation in the photograph in Halifax and later exhibited in a horizontal format could not be more different from the clear cut virtuous neutrality of gray. During 1975 and 76, Richter had continued to investigate the possibilities of Gray, producing, amongst other works, the three freestanding works in, in which a glass panel is painted in oil on one side, as we've just seen, the most complex of which, Double Pane of Glass, is, of course, on show upstairs in the exhibition. However, he felt that he had reached an impasse. As he wrote to Marlis Grutrich, after the strictly monochromatic or non-chromatic paintings, it was rather difficult just to keep going. Even if such a thing had been possible, I had no desire to produce variations on a theme. So I set out in a totally opposite direction. The earliest manifestation of this new direction was an ambitious painting titled Construction, 1976. This is a painting which is 250 by 300 centimeters. The painting seems to refer to, ar to, the architectural and to architectural and geometric forms and is reminiscent of early 20th century modernist painting. 
but it contains all the elements that would preoccupy the artist for the next decade or more, notably colour, scale, flatness, depth, illusionism and arbitrariness. Well into the 80s, as we may see in paintings like Hedge, again upstairs, geometric forms were being introduced to paintings, even at a late stage in their evolution. However, the strong per perspectival character of construction left Richter dissatisfied. At this stage, the challenge of free composition at this size was too great without such self-imposed constraints as, the rendering, as rendering the photographic image or applying simple greys to a canvas. So Richter moved to a more manageable size and a very different technique, radically modifying his method of working and developing his interest in drawing. He also began to use the camera as an instrument with which to reinterpret his own paintings rather than simply as a source for the images of others. It was these changes that preoccupied Richter over the five years between 1976 and 1980, a period of change in his personal life and of slow progress in his painting by comparison with the productivity of the years before and after. In the five years following construction, Richter produced fewer than 150 paintings. Only 24 of these were larger than 80 by 80 other, I should say, than the grey paintings, the clouds and the skies painted in 1976 that can be regarded in a certain sense as a hangover from his work in 75. Only three were figurative subjects, two portraits of Betty and his first flower piece, two of which again are upstairs. But it was during this period of doubt, I would argue, that Richter laid the foundation for the second half of his career and for his practice as a painter of non-objective abstract paintings. As he explained in the, summer of 1970, in, in the summer of 1977, on small canvases, I put random, illogical colors and forms, mostly with long pauses in between, which made sure that these paintings, if you can call them that, became more and more heterogeneous. I'm just going to move forward. Ugly sketches is what they are, the total antithesis of the purest grey pictures. Colourful, sentimental, associative, anachronistic, random, polysemic, almost like pseudo-diagrams, except that they are not legible because they are devoid of meaning or logic, if such a thing is possible, which is a fascinating point in itself, if not the most important of all although I know too little about it. An exciting business, as if a new door had opened for me. The first of these small sketches, or studies, as Richter also called him, was the one on the screen I'm showing you now, 3981, a composition in which the white and black forms float in front of a ground, rather as if painted on gauzes in front of a theatre backdrop. In this early group, some sketches were overpainted several times as Richter searched for a resolution of the composition. Sheets in Atlas, and here I show two, show him photographing small sketches at each stage of the composition. This is the first, and this is page 412 where you see a similar evolution recorded um, by the camera. Another sheet in Atlas, page 405, shows him isolating four separate details within the canvas. It was these four details that he chose as models for the composition of paintings 417 to 420, the last of which is again in our exhibition. In these soft abstracts, as he calls them, Richter takes the free improvisation of the sketch, frees it, freezes it, and objectifies it through the lens, and then magnifies and projects the new image onto the canvas. He obliges himself to develop a vocabulary of paint which bears no resemblance to the tactility and impasto of the original. In using the camera as his intermediary, 
Richter had discovered a way of conceiving an abstract painting devoid of subjectivity and not dependent on methods of automatism or unconscious gesture that had been deployed by the abstract expressionists, a process which has a parallel but obviously a very different result in Liechtenstein's anatomized brushstroke. Come back to this. <clears throat> However, it was not an abstract painting devoid of meaning. Two of these soft abstract paintings were selected for Documenta 6 in June 77, but withdrawn by Richter after the press view, in part because of the placing of the works, but principally in disgust at what he saw as the superficiality of the chosen theme, painting about painting. As he wrote to Grutrich, Paintings are always about painting. It is as obvious as the fact that a loaf of bread baked today is only that way because of the experience acquired from all the bread that has ever been baked before. You can't make this into a theme, bakery about bakery, without going bust straight away. <laughs> Significantly, Richter was still describing these works as abstract pictures rather than paintings. In his mind, at least, they remained pictures of something maybe something incomprehensible, but nevertheless concrete. We may note that the title of his exhibition in Halifax in the summer of 1978 was 17 Pictures. And as he said, I preferred to use the term picture instead of painting. By doing so, I wanted to emphasize my dissociation from painting, a dissociation I use as a method, but do not pursue as a goal. For Richter, the subject of these works was arbitrariness, a state in which, as he put it, almost anything is possible. To me, this arbitrariness has always seemed a central problem in both abstract and representational painting. What reason is there for placing one thing next to another in any particular format, any particular color, with any particular outline, with any particular likeness? In these large, soft abstracts, the camera became the eye through which Richter eliminates the subjectivity of his own mark. It also allows him to distill the composition by concentrating his focus or by reorientation, as in this painting, 428, where he takes an almost complete image from a small sketch, 431, sorry, 431, and reorientates it through 90, and turns it through 90 degrees. You can see here, these two. When Richter arrived in Nova Scotia, he continued to paint small abstract sketches, including Halifax, the painting on our cover, which was one of the few paintings of this period to bear a title. It was an intense few weeks, but it gave him the opportunity to explore three concerns that would lay the foundations for a new form of independent abstraction and the next phase of his practice, line, color, and the camera. During the previous year, Richter had been developing new strategies to approach the issue of abstraction. These small studies were more dependent on line than anything he had attempted before. With his academic training in East Germany, he was an accomplished draftsman However, his use of the medium had been sparing. Between 1962 and 1976, he produced fewer than 100 sheets, mostly figurative drawings dating from 1964, 5 and 7, studies for four panes of glass and other unachieved sculptures from 66, many studies for the placing of sculpture and painting in rooms, and a group of mountain and seascapes from the late 60s. Intriguingly, Three sheets from 1967, of which I show one here, explore possible compositions for small, square, often geometric abstract paintings. Richter, as we've heard, has flirted with abstraction during his time in the GDR. The recently discovered monoprints Elba show him to be conscious of Fautry and other informal painting as early as 1957, and after his visit to Documenta, uh, where he had been impressed, as we again have heard this morning, by Pollock and Fontana, he again attempted abstract painting. But many of these works were later destroyed or excluded from his catalogue resume. 
The small compositional drawings became the impetus, however, for a group of 23 small abstracts from 1968, three of which can be seen in the present exhibition. And this, again, as we've seen this morning, and this, can be taken as typical examples in their exploration of abstraction at its most basic means, exploring either the simple methodology of taking a brush across a canvas, or the most straightforward of Tashis gestures, perhaps influenced by Vols. Such experiments paved the way for a group of in-paintings from the early 70s, characterized by the manipulation of paint and an all-over treatment of the surface so that process determines the composition. Decisions about color are avoided by the simple expedient of allowing primary colors to mix until they form an almost uniform blue, brown, green, or gray. And this is a painting from 1973. In 1976, after making fewer than 10 drawings since 1968, Richter made six small works on paper in a uniform size after one of his new abstract sketches. The sketch and one of the drawings. I should add that the sketch that I show there is turned through 180 degrees from what is shown in the catalogue resume. Um, not having seen the painting, I'm not certain which is the right orientation. But we know that the catalogue resume is by no means perfect, as we've discovered to our cost in the uh, catalogue. But the reprint will have the painting, some of the paintings the right way around. Um, so he's working here from a sketch and making six drawings. Two years later, without a studio in Halifax, we find him pursuing a similar path, creating 66 graphite drawings on paper that explore ideas that have been developing in oil sketches. Two kinds of composition emerge. In some, an interaction between line and scumbled color of these sketches had become the dominant theme. In Atlas, he records some of the stages in the evolution of one such composition Um, one, so, one such composition um, from an initial mark on the canvas, as you see on, on, on the top left, uh, through the sketch to an image that tests its strength as a large painting on the wall, complete with a spectator. You can see in the bottom right-hand side the notion of the painting on the wall with a spectator, a very common Richter um, device. Before it is photographed and enlarged to become a full-size canvas, this is the sketch, and then finally the painting, not quite in focus, but it was certainly a soft focus abstract painting. In others, such as this, Drawing is obliterated through the strategy of dragging a loaded, relatively dry brush across the canvas so to establish a surface that is an early forerunner of paintings from the late 80s. A second group of works on paper begun in Halifax and probably completed shortly after his return announce a new medium for Richter, watercolour. These delicate sheets in which washes of green and yellow float over the pencil indi indications of horizontal abstract paintings must surely, surely reflect Richter's response to the premature death the year earlier of his close friend and companion on visits to New York, Brinky Palermo. Palermo's own watercolors with their rich browns and purples, as well as heightened reds and oranges, owe much to Boyce, but here we find Richter adopting more acid hues and the yellows and greens that formed the dominant colors of the large paintings he was to achieve as abstract paintings in the early 80s. The visit to Halifax, as we've seen, concluded with another novel investigation. Encouraged perhaps by the conceptually oriented atmosphere of the college, Richter decided to photograph his oil sketch Halifax from different, as he put it, 
from different sides and angles, under varying light conditions and from varying distances. In order to do this, he went as far as to take the canvas off the stretcher and drape it over a table and a chair. As he later wrote to Buchlow, the photograph represents an even more uncompromising search for appearance than one could ever achieve with a painting. A painted picture, even if it is entirely illusionistic, will always contain some reality, since it is made by hand and is a picture traditionally defined as painting. In contrast, a photograph loses its own reality the more precisely it portrays the other reality. And if you look at it like that, the photograph's only reality is its own unreality, i.e. its non-existence, its actual quality. As you can see, he said, I find it difficult to describe. The black and white images that result have been compared with Man Ray's dust breeding photographs of the traces of dust on Duchamp's large glass, a comparison that is also likely to have occurred both to Richter with his interest in Duchamp and his colleagues at the Nova Scotia. Richter mounted his black and white images to form the work 128 details from a picture, Halifax, 1978. In 1980, he published a 72-page book containing the 128 de details in a sequence, the Nova Scotia pamphlets two, And of course, in 1998, the work was issued both as a limited edition print comprising eight and white black black and white offset prints and a limited edition artist's book of 264 pages. When he returned to Dusseldorf, Richter immediately threw himself into preparations for the exhibition of abstract paintings that would be shown in Eindhoven in October, November 78, and in a modified form as his first exhibition in London at the Whitechapel Art Gallery in March 79. In Eindhoven, the focus lay on the two groups of large, soft, abstract paintings, one completed the previous year, the other based on the new oil sketches and painted on his return from Halifax. At Whitechapel, the decision was taken to omit most of the first group of soft abstracts in favour of a small selection of earlier paintings, including Olympia, the Sphinx, a large colour chart from 1974, the four tourist paintings, two of which are upstairs, and two Vesuvius subjects. The main body of the gallery was given over to the most recent large abstracts, as well as to more than 20 oil studies. Amongst these was Halifax, the enduring significance of which may be perceived that by this moment, Richter had already made a postcard from a color image of the detail of the painting. This is the painting a rather poor reproduction of it. The painting is actually lost at present, and this is a reproduction from the catalogue resume. It hasn't been photographed for many years. And he made this postcard. The two small holes on the right are an indication that the significance of this little image was not recognized by the archivist at the Whitechapel. <laughs> and I don't blame the archivist. I suspect I put the punch holes in myself probably in 1979, in order to keep the postcard. But in any event, here you see, I think as far as I know at the moment, the only colour, there must be many other detail of this painting, Halifax, which of course corresponds in many ways to the uh, black and white images that are now much better known. A second colour detail, uh, was selected by Richter as the image for the poster for the exhibition. Here you see uh, the Whitechapel and the view of the show. They reflecting wish, Richter's wish that the large room be divided by the most ordinary arrangement of screens placed between the four columns of the lower gallery. He was keen that the paintings should be given breathing space and the studies, as you'll see in the next slide, should be mounted in groups. Halifax, I think, is one in from the right-hand end. The exhibition was barely noticed by the press, though Time Out described the show in successive weeks as 15 years of horribly sick and syrupy paintings and vacuous can canvases which are either tongue-in-cheek, send-up, or horribly sick. 
Adrian Searle, writing in Art Scribe, was rather more perceptive. They are really quite stunning paintings, rich in mystery and pervaded by an ambiguous and somehow repellent sensuality. The Tate acquired a large painting and its related sketch. Richter himself was pleased with the show after initial apprehension. In Whitechapel, things are going better than I thought, he wrote to Buchlow the day before the preview. I had difficulties at home planning for the non-museum rooms, but now everything's hanging, I like it even better than in Eindhoven. Somehow everything seems fresher, more colorful, and I am learning to understand the paintings more and more with time. Richter's slowly increasing confidence was apparent from the speed with which he had completed seven large canvases immediately on his return from Halifax in time for the exhibition in Eindhoven. But it was also evident in the freedom and complexity of the surface in the small sketches. Richter was now dragging the paint in layers across the canvas, occasionally rubbing down the impasto and often laying on or scraping away the paint with a palette knife or spatula. Over the next 18 months, his preoccupation with surface resulted in a flattening of space, both in the small sketches and in the large paintings that continued to be fabricated by means of the photographic enlargement of the small sketch. This move was accompanied by an introduction of colour more vibrant than anything previously seen in his painting. Just two examples, a relatively small painting from 1979 and a much larger painting from the same date. It was this commitment to the integrity of surface, coupled with heightened colour, that were the poles that governed the creation of the, in the following years of Richter's two largest abstract paintings, one of which, of course, is upstairs. Terrible slide, sorry. Stroke on blue and then stroke on red, which, of course, is upstairs. Originally, both shown under the title Two Yellow Strokes. In the small sketches, an expressive stroke over a stippled surface is itself overlaid with a dragged dry brush. The enlargement partly flattens the detail and allows the painter to simulate the contours of the impasto and the subtle layering by means of a flat, deadpan technique that deceives the viewer into thinking that he is looking at a reproduction of a painting rather than at a painting itself. Such is the accomplishment of his painting that the illusion works close up as well as at the distance of normal viewing where it hangs either here or in the school at Soest. In a much smaller painting, 4561, also currently lost, which is only 65 by 80, he achieves a similar effect by very different means. Looking at this image after the stroke, it is difficult to read its scale as the ochre white paint is dragged across the surface, carrying with it some of the paint from the layers beneath. It was this small work, it was in this small work that Richter first employed the squeegee, initially a card, but later perspex, an instrument that became one of his principal means for the manipulation of paint during the next three decades. The squeegee gave him a quality that he prized but could not achieve in either the small sketches where the image reflected the hand of the artist or in the large paintings where the image was a given controlled by the camera and the scale of enlargement. What the squeegee introduced was the element of chance, an absence of control within known boundaries so that the unexpected, the arbitrary, became a part of the work. Interestingly, 4561 originally car carried the title Joseph. As with Halifax, the adoption of a name rather than a number suggests that Richter already recognised the significance of this now lost painting. Another title painting, Faust, 460, comprising three large canvases hung together as a triptych, marks the end of this phase of Richter's dependence on the camera as a means of composing large abstract painting. And you could regard construction, which we saw much earlier, and this painting, Faust, as in a way bracketing this period of Richter's work. The complexity and color of Faust indicate an artist who is now truly in con control. From this point on, Richter has the confidence to make an independent mark 
and to construct a composition at a scale that, allow, that allows him to stand back and to draw with a brush across the canvas or to use the squeegee taking away or spreading paint across the surface in a great sweep. He does not quite know what the action will reveal. That confidence is also evident in the dramatic increase in his output once he was able to begin what he saw as his free abstracts. Richter records 60 paintings in the catalogue for 1981 and a further 55 in 1982, a sharp contrast with the difficult years of 1976 to 80, during which he never achieved more than 30 works in a year. By the time of Documenta 7 in 1982, in which he showed five large abstract paintings, including Rot, seen here, he was already beginning to be recognized as an abstract painter with a distinctive voice. As Richter wrote in a statement in the catalogue, abstract pictures are fictive models as they make visible a reality that we can neither see nor describe, but, its existence, but in its existence we can postulate. In abstract painting, we have found a better way of gaining access to the unvisualizable, the incomprehensible. How he took this forward is, of course, another chapter in the story. But by now, the trials of his period in Halifax were over and the door was fully open. Thank you. <laughs>